uh, on, be on behalf of the rector of the University of Santiago de Compostela, it is a great pressure for me to welcome Dr. May Britt Moser to our university, to our faculty of medicine, where neuroscience has been one of the main fields of research for years. I'm sure that your presence here will serve to encourage our students to follow a scientific career in the, in the next years with your work and your success as a model. The image of the Nobel Prize has been always present in our university as a guide for our students and academics through initiatives such as the Programa Conciencia, and therefore, I want also to acknowledge Nobel Media and AstraZeneca Foundation for the selection of our university for this event. Quiero rematar agradeciendo a todos los miembros de nuestra comunidad universitaria a su presencia en este acto, pero quiero dirigirme especialmente a nuestro alumnado. En primer lugar, animando, animando vos a continuar teniendo esa inquietud de por lo conocimiento que os ten feito estar aquí en este día, pero también deseando que a presencia con nos de una investigadora asendeira serva de alicerce para hacer medrar una vocación, una sólida vocación científica en todos y e todas vos. Permitidme terminar esta breve presentación para pedir vos a todas y e a todos los aquí presentes, y e aprovechando que tenemos entre nos a un premio Nobel, que sigades, sigamos a trabajar para conseguir que esa tan necesaria y e tan deseada igualdad entre hombres y e mujeres sea también una realidad no oído de investigación. Doctor May Britt Moser, it is a privilege for us to attend to your conference. Thank you very much and welcome to Santiago de Compostela. Good morning, everybody. My name is Adam Smith from Nobel Media, which is the media arm of the Nobel Foundation based in Stockholm, Sweden. And on behalf of all of the Nobel organizations, I'd like to welcome you to this morning's lecture, which, as you'll see from your programs, is part of the Nobel Prize Inspiration Initiative. The initiative is a collaboration between Nobel and AstraZeneca, designed to take Nobel laureates around the world to meet the next generation of scientists. And here you are. We've been running this for eight years. We've run 24 events on five continents, but we've never been to Santiago de Compostela before. And I'm really delighted to be here, and I'd like to thank the University of Santiago de Compostela and Vice Director Victor Arte for welcoming us so nicely. Thank you very much indeed. So you know, this this is exactly what the initiative is about. It's about an audience of young scientists. And so I'd like to take a photograph of you all, please. Because <laughs> I need to send this back to Stockholm just to show them what this is all about. So if you'll all say, Nobel Prize. <laughs> Got you. Thank you very much indeed. When we were discussing this event with our Spanish colleagues in AstraZeneca, they said, you know, this is our 25th event, our Silver Jubilee event, and Spain's an important place, so we have to have a special laureate. So we know most laureates are men, but we'd like a woman. And we know that most laureates are older people, but we'd like a young woman. And we know that most laureates have kind of come towards the end of their active research careers, but we'd like somebody still at the forefront of their research. So a female Nobel laureate who's young and still very active in their research that sounded like Mybrit Moser. But I said, Mybrit Moser's really hard to get hold of. She's very busy, and when I ask her to do things, she's always really polite, but she says, I'm sorry, you know, I can't come. <laughs> but there must be something very special about Santiago de Compostela, because when I asked her, she said yes. <laughs> and here she is. 
I like to think about these lectures as being a way of reminding everyone how exciting it is to do science, because when you become a scientist, you're thrilled, and then the troubles of science, the troubles with your experiments, the trouble with funding, the trouble with how to get a job, sometimes weigh you down. But it's nice once in a while to be reminded why science is so lovely, and I cannot think of anybody better to do that than my Brit Moser. So I wish you a lovely lecture and leave it to my Brit Moser. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> thank you so much for inviting me, and uh, thank you to Adam and uh, your noble uh, initiative and uh, AstraZeneca for paying, and to the university here in Santiago, uh, Compostela. Um, I've been met here in Spain with so warm-hearted people, and I think even though I haven't been that many times to Spain, I think that is what you logged on, Adam, when you asked me, are you willing to join me to, to, to Spain? And then, yes, of course, <laughs> I want to go to Spain. And I want to meet uh, uh, the, the, the young students in Spain and their supervisors. So the title of my talk today is Space, Time, and Memory in, in, in the brain. So, so what I would just like you to uh, do today is just to join me on a travel, a travel into the brain. And then let's explore how it looks like and hopefully when you leave this room, and I know there are two extra rooms, so hello to those other people in the other rooms, uh, <clears throat> that we have a common understanding how the brain and how the hippocampus is generating our daily type of memory. I will start with this tiny girl. And you, you know, this, this girl, she had one mission in her life, and that was to try to understand the world around her. And what happened with this little girl is that she was allowed to live a life driven by such questions. How do, we, uh, uh, how do we create behavior? How, how, what, what happens when we have emotions? All these things were so important for this tiny child and also for the adult person. And I want to share a memory with you first that this tiny girl experienced when she was a grown-up and being a happy scientist. allowed to laugh. <laughs> so do you know why I just exploded in joy? I exploded in joy because, as I said, as an adult, as a scientist, I was allowed to continue to ask questions 
And when we ask questions at our institute, people in the international world, they loved our work. And you know, the Nobel Prize is a stamp, a quality stamp on what you're doing. And that is what we are aiming for, getting these quality stamps, either by ourselves, because we are proud of what we are doing, or from others, or maybe both. So I promised you to tell you about uh, episodic memory, and then I need the help from Endel Tulving, because he suggested that you can describe episodic memory with three questions. One question is, where did it happen? Another question is, when did it happen? And then the third question is, what happened? And what, we, what I'm trying to do now in the talk is to go through these questions and ask, are the brain structures specialized helping the brain to, uh, to sort out the information that is needed um, for the brain to generate episodic memory? So first we have to see where is episodic memory or what structures are important for episodic memory. And then there is this beautiful structure here. This is the hippocampus that was dissected out by the Hungarian Laszlo Seres, the professor. And he said he worked quite hard in order to find the, the most beautiful hippocampus so that he could show them why hippocampus is getting uh, the name, the seahorse or the hippocampus. And you know more Latin than I do. What is important for us to know is that, first of all, we have two of them. They're lying in here. And if there is a lesion in these structures, then you don't, you're not able to code new memories. So if you would have a, a lesion in these structures, you would never ever remember my beautiful trousers. And that happened, in fact, and, and some of you, I know some of you are medical students um, and probably some in, in psychology, you have probably heard about HM. Have you heard about the patient HM? Some of you? No? So the, pa the patient HM, he had epileptic seizures in the 50s already. And then uh, they decided to do an experimental surgery where they removed this beautiful structure from his brain on both sides. And what happened when he woke up is that he was much better on uh, uh, intellectual tests, on IQ tests, and uh, he was social, he was a wonderful, warm uh, man, but when uh, the doctors and the nurses and the psychologists came back to him 15 minutes afterwards, he said, who are you? Never seen you before. And even when people told him really sad things from his life, he had all his emotions coming through him, and still he couldn't remember, for example, that his uncle died. But he could learn new things. So he could learn to do very, very complicated puzzles, because those, um, uh, those structures were not damaged by this surgery. So we are back to Tulving, and we go now and ask, where can you encode this question, where? And in the 60s and 70s, one of my supervisors, John O'Keefe, who we got the Nobel Prize with, he was inspired by this story by the patient, H.M. And he was so curious what is this hippocampus doing? And the way he wanted to explore that question was to have an animal that was running around and then he connected small sensors close to the cells in the hippocampus and then he was able to magnify these small electrical signals 10,000 times so that he could listen to these cells when the animal was running around. So why did he do that, do you think? 
animal is just running around, and then you hear pop, 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 pop. What can you learn from that? You can learn from that if you are observing the animal and you ask, why is this cell active here? And why is this cell silent here? And I'm going to play a video to you here from our lab demonstrating um, this uh, type of cells from the hippocampus. Here this uh, rat is running around. And you see this hand coming in here, just throwing chocolate so that the animal is motivated to run around. And one red dot, that is one electrical potential. And do you see that this rat is so happy to get the chocolate? So the rat is running everywhere. And the rat is doing exactly the same things in all places. So why is this cell active there and not there? Isn't that crazy? And what is even more crazy that John O'Keefe learned when he was sitting there observing this rat and then listening, that was when he listened to another cell, that cell could be active in this corner. A third cell could be active here. And then he made color plots like you see here. So this means just that uh, the cell is silent and this is where the cell is, is very active. And you know what? So in, in, in the States, then Bruce McNaughton and his student, they recorded more than 100 cells at the same time from such rats. And they showed that if you record this for some 10, 15 minutes, then you can predict where the animal is in the environment with a precision of only five centimeters of error. Isn't that amazing? So just to listen to these cells, you know where the rat is. Isn't that scary? But it's fun too. So in, in 1995, I was a PhD student and I just defended my thesis together with five others. And this is uh, my ex-husband, Edward Moser, and still my dearest colleague. And our daughter here, we have two daughters. And here are our sensor or examinators. And this, and this is uh, my supervisor, Per Andersen. So one of the uh, examiners, that was John O'Keefe. So that meant that we got a contact that was important for us. Because we asked Per Andersen if he could arrange so that we could go to John and learn from John to record such cells in the hippocampus. So we brought our two children to London and spent the summer with John O'Keefe and we learned how to record places. Then, uh, I'm not going to tell the story because that is also a, a, a strange story, how we got our lab in, in Norway half a year after our PhD defense. But I can tell you what questions we brought with us when we came to Trondheim and set up our lab. So we started out by asking this question that I already asked. Why are these cells in the hippocampus active in these different places? So we first asked, is it so that in order to get the place cell from this structure, which is the hippocampus in the rodent, and here you have removed the cortex that is just above the hippocampus, that's a beautiful uh, sausage structure. Have you seen it? You haven't seen it? It's so beautiful. And, 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 and when, you, when you then slice this hippocampus, you open up and then you see the different cell types in this structure. And what is so typical with hippocampus is that uh, the information flow is coming from the enterocortex cortex back here, going into the hippocampus, through the dentate, through C3, up to C1, and then out again. So there is a loop 
within the hippocampus. So our question was then, do you need this loop in order to see these place cells in CA1, or can you skip the loop? If you can skip the loop, then uh, uh, either C1 is generating these uh, place signals itself, or the information is coming from outside. So we had this fantastic student in the lab. He was first a psychology student, and then he decided to do medicine um, while he did his PhD in our lab. <clears throat> and his fingers were golden. He could do surgeries that uh, were just so excellent. So he was able to either use a tiny, tiny knife, and, 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 and this structure is only, you see, this is the scale, 10 millimeters long. So he had a tiny knife, and he cut this path. And he also made botanic acid lesion for, for, for the adosa of you as specialists. But, but, but the aim here was to block this information in this loop. So when he did that, then we asked, are we still able to see place signals in C1 of hippocampus. Can you vote? How many of you think that uh, we still would see some place signals in the hippocampus? None? One. <laughs> Good. We need, we need uh, some uh, diversity. So you're right. <laughs> so after this information loop was cut, there were still place cells recorded from this structure in the hippocampus. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven from one rat at the same time. And we had several rats which showing this. So then we asked ourselves, how is this possible that you can get these place signals even though the loop within the hippocampus is cut? And our best guess was to go to entorhino cortex. And this is a rat brain that you see from behind, and the cerebellum is removed, and this colorful area here, that is enterino cortex. This is the lateral enterino cortex, this is the medial enterino cortex, and the pink part, that is the dorsolateral medial enterino cortex, that is giving information to the dorsal part of the hippocampus where John O'Keefe discovered the place cells. So we decided, together with Menno Witte, a professor at our institute, to put our sensors in this position. People had been recording from deep in this structure, and if you remember that, you might figure out why they didn't see any interesting things. Can you try to remember that and solve that question yourself? What I say now, we decided to go more dorsal and when we recorded signals, it looked like this. Sorry. So if we see then the rat here, the rat is running in the box. There is no sound, but you see that there are some small uh, dots here, white dots. Those white dots are the same type of dots that you saw on the place cell, the red dots. So it's the electrical potentials. So if you had been sitting there like John O'Keefe did and observing this pattern, what would you conclude? Noise. No, nothing interesting. Would you say that? So maybe the other scientists were right that there is nothing interesting. Should we give up? What happened? Oh, we didn't give up because we had very happy animals that were interested in covering the whole environment if they got chocolate. And if you do that, and we also moved the animals to a big environment, and here you see one of the cells that we recorded, together with uh, this couple here, Marianne Fyn and Torkel Hafting. She was a PhD student in our lab, and he was a technician. So 
this is the, the black uh, traces, that is the trace of the animal, and then these dots you now know, know, that is the electrical potential of the cell. Do you like this pattern? It's not too bad, it's quite regular, isn't it? A hexagon. And what do you do with hexagons? You can fill them with equilateral triangles. So you can tile your bathroom with these beautiful cells. And remember, this is biology. This is not mathematics, this is not physics, it's biology. It's generated by cells very, very deep in the brain. And how is that possible? I'm going to give you the answer quite soon. But before, I want to tell you another thing about these grid cells that we think is the metric in the brain, a 2D metric. And that is a phenomenon that if you think of, you, you, can, you can paint a balloon with these fields, and if you blow up the balloon, then you see the fields are expanding and the distance between the fields are expanding. And that is exactly what happened when you go down into the structure, dorsal and then more and more ventral. This is one cell and you see that the distance here is quite small and, uh, and uh, the fields are small and then it's increasing and increasing. So the scale, the resolution is, is worse, uh, more ventral. So what happens then? I told you to remember why the other people didn't find what we found. Why do you think? Because they recorded down here and they had a tiny, uh, tiny box, one by one meter box that the rat was running in. So if, if this is if this cell has now a one meter field and you put a box around here, it's just a mess. So when you go deeper in the entorhinal cortex or more ventral, you need a much bigger box. So we use box of two meters in size and so on to record the biggest cells. And we even, oh, that I haven't told you. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't show you that, uh, that video, I didn't bring it. But we even had an 18 meter linear track in the lab because we were so eager to, to measure the biggest place field. And uh, in the hippocampus, I think it was uh, uh, up to 10 meters. So the question we started out with is, is it possible then to say that you can go from this grid signal to a place signal? How can you do that? You can do that because, as I said, these grid cells, they come in different sizes. And if you align the grid cells on top of each other with the different sizes, then you see that the bump here in the middle will sum up to be a big bump, but here at the edges, the signal will cancel each other out. So you go from all these grid cells of different sizes to a place cell in the hippocampus. Tick off, first mission fulfilled. Now we've got new questions. Because, as I said, this grid cell is so deep in the brain. And then we asked, how is it possible that this cell is so precise? It looks like a coordinate system with perfect XY coordinates. Then we figure out the information that this cell needs is about the direction the animal is moving and also where the animal is heading. So that means that we will have to search for a compass in the brain and for a speedometer. Do you think that's possible? No? Yes. We need strong Italian women to show that, and that's Francesca Sargolini. So she put her electrodes in between these grid cells, and she showed that there are head direction cells. And these cells just work like this, so if the animal is, uh, is going to west, 
then this cell is uh, active. And then another cell will select another uh, position to be a, or, or a direction to be active. These cells were discovered in another structure before by uh, Jim Rank and, and, and Taube, but ha hadn't been shown in a trinal cortex before. So then we have the directional input to, to the, um, the grid cells. But what about the speedometer? Are there cells in our brain that is measuring how fast we are walking or running? And how can you study that question? If you came to my lab and I told you, can you find a speedometer in the brain if it exists? A fantastic postdoc from Argentina, Patagonia, Emilio Krupp. He designed a car for the rats. But what happens when you are just a, a passenger in a car? You fall asleep. And you can't fall asleep if we want to record from yourselves, because then we don't know what is happening. So in order to keep this animal awake, the car didn't have a bottom, exactly like the Flintstone car. So Emilio, he could then decide the speed of the car and thereby deciding the speed of the rat because the rat had to follow the car. And in this way, he could control the speed and he could record the cells. And this is an example of uh, such recording. So in this panel, the rat is running north and in this panel, the rat is running south. These lines, that is each individual lap, these dots, Pop, 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 pop. That is the activity of the cell that he is recording. And then we can just see the speed of the car here in gray. When the speed of the car is high, this cell is really active. Pop, 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 pop. And then when the animal is driving very, very slowly, then the cell is almost quiet. And it doesn't matter whether the animal is driving north or south. You see the same thing. And then you can ask, but rats are never, ever always driving in a lab. Do they? No. So they, they walk, they run. So then the question is, do you see such cells when the animal is deciding the speed uh, the, uh, him, him or herself? And this is just 12 recordings, 12 different cells, when the animal is running in the box that you know, chasing chocolate, and there's nothing interesting in these patterns. But what is interesting is when you correlate the speed of the animal with the firing rate of the cell. Do you see that there's a linear relationship between the speed of the animal and the firing rate? in all these cells. It's a beautiful relationship. So here we then have information to this grid cell about both the direction that the animal is moving and also the speed uh, that uh, the animal is using. And that is exactly the information we, uh, we need in order to get precise um, uh, firing pattern. So then we would like to understand the network of these cells. And you know about the excitatory cells and the inhibitory cells. And some inhibitory cells in the entrinal cortex, we can stain with parvalbumin. Some inhibitory nerve cells or, or interneurons, we can stain with somatostatin. You know these things. So, and now there are these mutant mice, the Cree mice, and uh, this Chinese uh, couple, Miao and Chichen, they used these cream mice and used the artificial dread technique to ask the question, are the parvalbumin gabergic neurons involved in the pattern of the grid cells? So then they have the artificial receptor only in these interneurons, and they give the artificial drug systemically to the animal, 
And this drug in, is then only activating or inhibiting those cells that it's, uh, uh, it's uh, tagged on. And that is uh, what happened here. So the CNO is then blocking the activity of the parvalbumin interneurons. So here you see first this cell, the beautiful grid pattern. But when this artificial drug is activating these artificial receptors and blocking the activity of the parvalbumin cells, you see that there's nothing that looks like a grid pattern anymore. It's not precise. And when the drug is out of the body, you get back the grid pattern. And that is just summed up here with the grid score for all the cells. And you see that the grid score is very, very reduced uh, 30 minutes after this drug uh, injection uh, uh, compared to both before and afterwards. What happens to the speed cells? Are they affect affected? Yes. So if we then uh, look at one example here, here you see a speed cell that has uh, a beautiful relationship between the firing rate and the speed, but here it's flat when the drug is working. And then again, when the drug is out of the body, the speed signal uh, is there. And this is just summed up here. Speed score is very, very low during uh, the activation of, of this, uh, this drug. So it seems like both the speed and the grid activity is uh, uh, ruined when you give this drug. But when you try other types of interneurons and, uh, and block their activity, this doesn't happen. So it seems like these cells, uh, uh, the precision of the grid cell is depending on the parvalbumin cells. So now I'm just going to describe a tiny bit the difference between the maps that you see in the entorhinal cortex and in the hippocampus. So in the entorhinal cortex, this map is like a mathematical paper, a coordinate system, a metric that you can bring with you to any room, even new rooms. It's a universal map, and it doesn't change, except that it's shifted and it's rotated. And that is what we see here. If you go from one room to the next room, these different dots in the different colors are just three different grid cells. What about when the animal is sleeping? Then we have this fantastic postdoc from Britain, Richard Gardner, and he asked if the grid cells that are active together when the animal is running around when the animal is sleeping, is there a connection between those cells? And that is exactly what he showed. This is not published yet. So this is when the animal is running, and you see that the correlation is very, very high. And the same thing happens when the animal is in deep sleep. And again, also in the REM sleep. But cells that are not correlated during behavior are not showing correlated activity during sleep. So then it's, it's a very static uh, uh, map, the entorhinal cortex map. What about the hippocampal map, the play cells? How can you ask whether this is just the same map that is used over and over again? Then we had this fantastic Norwegian PhD student, Charlotte Alme, and she said, now we have got such a wonderful lab with so many rooms. Let's just use all the rooms. So she had 11 recording rooms that she could use that were different. And she is such an animal lover that she was able to get these animals to run beautifully in all 11 rooms so that she could record play cells from the hippocampus from these animals when the animals were running in the different rooms. So this is just a design. Uh, you, uh, she started in a familiar environment and then a novel novel and then another novel and so on. And this is the way we analyze the data. So she just, in one room, she just collapsed 
all the cells on top of each other, and uh, uh, she used this population vector and just asked how does the activity look there, 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 and then she correlated these pixels together, and she got this matrix. And not, no surprise uh, that uh, the familiar room is then highly correlated with itself. But what you see here is that most of this matrix is just blue. That means that it's not correlated. That means that our different cells that are active in the different rooms. So all the maps in the different rooms are active. That means that you can go to this room and then you see, oh, this room, in this room, cell 10 to 20, they are active, but all the other cells are not active. Then you know, just by asking which cells are active, which room the rat is in. And on top of these play cells, you can put your memories. And you see some stars here, and that is just when the animal is visiting a room the second time, then they use exactly the same map. So it seems like you have different maps, different play cells that are active in different rooms, and this is what the memory system is using, because then you can put your memories on these different maps. Compared to the universal grid cell map, that is just a static map. So now I think we have talked more than enough about the question where uh, for the episodic memory. I think it's the time to talk about when. Is there some information in the entorhinal cortex that can be fed into the hippocampus about the when? And this is a story about I almost said my boy, because he came to the lab from Washington, 18 years old. So he was a bit older than my oldest daughter. And I said, no way that you can work in my lab, because uh, you are too young. And then I tested him, and he was just so brilliant. And then in one summer, he did more work than um, the postdoc that worked on that project. So he, uh, he, he was just exceptional. He also started to record from the sister area of the medial entorhinal cortex, the lateral entorhinal cortex. And he really wanted to understand what are these cells doing. And he recorded and he recorded. But we were just so confused because what he showed was that there is not a, 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 a pattern that looks normal. It's not stable. And you know, when you record these cells, like Charlotte did in the different rooms, then it should be stable. And it was not stable here. And we, we decided that we had to test these cells in a quite extensive um, experiment where uh, it was in the same room, it was in the same box, but the walls of the box were changed. So either it was a white wall or a black wall. And then in between these exposures, black, white, white, black, then the animal was allowed to be in this pot. And you see these were 12 recordings and I'm going to show you an example of some cells, and, and so that you understand why we're so, we're so confused. If we look at this cell, and these are the different boxes, black, white, white, black, black, white, and so on. Then you see that this cell is telling how, uh, how long time the, the animal has been in this box. So it's just ramping up the activity. And when it goes to a new box, it's just ramping up the activity. This cell doesn't care about the color of the box. This cell does something completely different. This cell is saying, I start high, but then I'm ramping down the activity throughout all these exposures. This cell is saying, I care about the color of the environment, and the time that animal is spending in the environment. So you see, it starts high and then it falls down, but less in the white box 
compared to the black box. You see that? Here is a different type of cell, wall color, and then it's reducing its activity throughout all this. So if, if you had been Albert's boss, how would you respond to such a result? Confused. So we were confused for eight years. And then, uh, uh, then uh, Albert uh, decided to, to, to check uh, with the GLM method, general uh, linear model method, how can you explain the variance that we see in the different tasks? And then he compared with these two structures that we know so well. The C3 cells that Charlotte Alma uh, checked in all these 11 rooms, and also uh, the grid cells in the medial and toronto cortex. Then he asked how many cells would uh, the variation of this uh, activity be explained by the wall color? Not much. Then he asked about the position of the animal. And then, of course, the grid cell says, yes, this is our function, this is our task, we take care of that function. And then when the, the, the comparison between the white and the black box and the position, then C3 said, this is my task. Then the lateral and toronal cortex came on and said, I care about time. So I can separate the black box that was early in the training compared to the black box that is coming later in the training. I'm, my function is to be a clock ticking for each episode and give each episode a tag. And this is necessary for us when we want to sort our memories in the correct sequence. But as you know, when you are bored, then you can't wait until uh, you can do something different. And time is going so slowly. But when you are so happy and doing something really, really fun, time is just flying too fast. And you know what? That is exactly what we saw in the lateral and toronal cortex. So when the animals were exposed to these boxes, black and white boxes, time was running differently and tagged the episodes differently from when the animal was running in the H-shape box. So here the rat is running up and down and getting a reward, up and down, up and down. And when you ask then the cells, are you able to differentiate between each time the animal is done with these laps? No. But this time, the, the clock tagged much more of the time when the animal was running within the task, because here you have these different um, paths. So the experience is then uh, 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 guiding how this clock is running. And that's very useful for our memories. And then finally, how much time do we have? Five minutes, okay. So then I have to hurry up. So how, how, would, you test, how would you test the what in the environment? The what for us, that is uh, episodes like this, you are listening to uh, me, uh, you know people, you have different names, you, you read uh, the curriculum, uh, you read a novel. But how can you test that on a rat? So for the rat, what you can do is, for example, to give the rat an object. And an easy object to give a rat, that is the, this uh, uh, Lego bricks or the, the, the Duplo. They are bigger. And then we can ask, 
And, and I, I, I will show here an experiment done by a colleague of us, uh, Jim Kneerum in the States. So he played with all these different uh, toys. He didn't use the Lego, but, but these toys. And these circles, the white circles, that is where the, uh, the object is. And now you know the code. When there are warm colors, you know that this cell is pop, 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 pop. And then it's silent here. So all these different cells, they respond to the object. Do you remember this guy? Wow, <laughs> I'm impressed. You have hippocampi. So he's the time guy, but he also played with objects because that is what we do in a lab. We have questions and we don't know exactly how to address the questions. And then we just have to play to see if we get answers that we understand. So he played with objects. So he trained his animals with this object, let the object stay here for 14 days. The animal is going back into the animal court and coming back here. Oh, there is my object. Then again and again. And then he removed the object. So it is like Christmas time, and people are sitting at their certain chairs around the table. And if there's one empty chair, you feel it. And this is probably what happens with these cells, that they are active when the object is not there. So we decided to call these cells trace cells. And Albert, he moved this object throughout the whole environment, and he made a grid cell pattern by removing the object, and there's no object there. He cleaned the floor with alcohol, with soap, with everything, and still this cell is saying, the object was there. And I remember that the object had been to these places. No trace, only in the mind of the animal. And finally, how much minutes Few, few, few minutes, maybe three. So then we have this guy, he's a Norwegian PhD student, and he recorded now in mice, and he didn't record in the lateral internal cortex, but he recorded in the medial internal cortex, where we found the grid cells. And he found cells that responded to where the object is relative to the animal. So if you record such a type of cell with me, I can show you the pattern. This is the object, this is the firing rate. Then if this is the object and you record such a cell from me, then this cell is active. When I'm here, even though I don't see the object, but when I'm here, I'm too far away. And when I'm here, I'm at the wrong direction towards the object. If you move the object, you will see the same pattern. If you exchange the object with different objects, you see the same pattern. So now I, I think I have just a few minutes to. So it, uh, I, I don't have time enough then to tell you this story, but uh, as, as you know, for, for our memories to work, we need retrieval cues. So space is a very good retrieval cue. Time is a good retrieval cue. If we say uh, a, a, a time that is, is valuable for you, you might associate a lot of memories around that time. And odor is also extremely important, and uh, even Marcel Proust, he wrote a novel about this, when his aunt gave him the madeleine cake, and he was dipping the madeleine cake in the tea. And when he was an adult, he got madeleine cake, and he dipped it in the tea. And suddenly, he was sent back to his childhood and he remembered the scene, he remembered the time, and he remembered the taste, and he remembered his own. This we can test in the lab, and I can't tell you the experiments. We can discuss that maybe afterwards, but I can show you the video how we can test this. Because we can give them the different odors here, banana and chocolate, 
And then we can teach Emma that if she is smelling banana, she has to go there. If she is smelling chocolate, she has to go there. Do you believe she can do it? Yeah, you, you are strong believers in our rats. And you should be, because we have excellent rats. So let's play the video. Chocolate. Chocolate. Not too bad. Banana. Yeah. So, you know, even rats do errors sometimes. <laughs> and if they do errors, they get frustrated and they don't concentrate and they sniff too short and they want to jump out of the whole situation. They want to escape. But then they concentrate again, back to track. And we needed this wonderful behavior, and we needed the errors in order to understand how the association between where and what, the odor and the space, was uh, generated. And then uh, our fantastic Japanese postdoc, Kei Garashi, he had sensors in the lateral entorhinal cortex and in the hippocampus at the same time, follow the animal when Emma was completely naive. She didn't understand how to solve the task. And when Emma could do the task with the 85% uh, correct, and then compare how the maps look like when she was skilled and when she wasn't skilled. And it was beautiful. And I can tell you the, the story afterwards. So if the map was not there, she couldn't do the task. And you have, always, you have also had the feeling, I suppose, that your head is empty. And there's no active cells, and then you don't remember. Have you had that feeling? Yeah. Or maybe you are too young. What is important, and now I'm stealing a few minutes from you, but what is important here is that you're young, so you don't have these problems, but by age, some of these cells die, and especially in entorhinal cortex. And when these cells die in the entorhinal cortex, these people get problems to encode new memories, they get problems with spatial navigation, and they get problems with the sequence of events. So this is the group. I told you about the people involved, and Edward Moser is, of course, involved in everything. We have got a lot of funding, um, and you can read that here. And then since uh, I'm spend, I, I'm, I don't want to spend too much time from your time, I just want to end with a memory from the West Coast. Thank you so much. Thank you. Other questions? Can you hear me? Okay. It was an excellent piece of work, but I am as impressed by your work as by your, your team. It's amazing all these people you are having in your group, and especially Albert Sau. Mm -hmm. He was 18 years old when mm -hmm. he arrived. Had 
he made any studies previously of medicine, psychology? So when he came to our lab to work with us in the summers, then he went back to Washington to, to study physics. Physics. And, he was and, a physicist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a physicist. Okay. That's a very good background. Uh, so, so then uh, he was headhunted by uh, Stanford. So now he's a postdoc in Stanford. Okay. And, he, and we are still collaborating with him. He's just excellent. Well, now we have some time for questions. You have three microphones uh, through all the, the, the hall. And there is also one microphone on the top. So if you want to make any question, you just raise your hand. In the meantime, uh, I want to make you a question. Uh, some years ago, we had here the visit of Torsten Wiesel. Oh. Uh, he was four or five times here in this university. And uh, well, as probably you know, but they don't know, Torsten Wiesel won the Nobel Prize because he found some structures here that are involved in the, in the visual uh, function. And he detected that this, uh, this function is created by experience. Mm. I mean, uh, this is not an innate function. This is something that you elaborate in your experience. In the case of space and time, are these innate functions or do you construct them with your experience? It's something like a Kantian Exactly. Kant, uh, yeah. So, so how many of you study philosophy? Some? Yeah, yeah. good. So you heard about Kant. And uh, he, he said that you need uh, this faculty of time and space in order to do like this tiny child that you saw on my first slide, to explore the world. If you don't have these faculties, you can't explore the world. And then your question is just excellent, because then we could go to our animals and ask this question. And of course, we, since we need animals that behave, we ask the question in a tiny different way uh, than how does it look like when you are just born. So we waited until the animal just opened the eyes. Mm -hmm. And rats, they typically open their eyes when they are 15 days of age. And then we had a wonderful postdoc in the lab, Ross Langston, and she put the tiny sensors in these baby rats and they were running around. And then she asked your question, are there play cells? in these young animals that just opened their eyes and their mission is to explore the world. And what she found was that uh, uh, the play cells were there, but they were not stable. She also decided to explore in the entorhinal cortex. And then she asked, what about the head direction cells? What about the grid cells? Are they there? And at that time, we didn't know about this time. So we haven't done that yet. So that's uh, one of the projects. So for the head direction cells, they were there. The border cells that I haven't told you about, they were there. But the grid cells were not mature yet. So the grid cells they didn't have this beautiful pattern. It wasn't perfect. You could see some fields, but they were not so regular as the hexagonal pattern that we see in the adult. And that is exciting because that gives us a window, like Torsten Wiesel and these people studying the vision, a window where we can ask, is it so that experience might affect the way you navigate? And we are doing those experiments now. So, anyone having a question? There, one. Here. Raise your hand, because otherwise you can. Okay. Can you please stand up? Okay. We was. 
And, and say, say, say what you are. Are you, are you a, a faculty or student? Or? Yes, uh, medicine, degree, degree, medicine degree student. Okay. And we were talking about two dimensions movement. Uh, what about three dimensions movement, like up and down? Oh, thank you for that question. So um, people have tried to, to do recordings in rats in a kind of 3D environment, but it has been a bit difficult. So the conclusions we are not so sure of. But then there is a fantastic group in Israel, uh, Nahum Ulanovsky's group, and he is studying bats. And bats, their brains, they look quite similar to, uh, to the rats. And he started first to record in the hippocampus. And he asked, we see the normal places when the bat is walking around, crawling. Do we see the same type of cells when the animal is flying? Mm -hmm. And what would be his first challenge? Of course, all these wings and all these uh, electrical problems. But also, as I said, the reason why we have nice data is that we have animals that are able to cover the whole environment. But of course, if you are just walking in a 2D environment, it's so much easier to cover all places in the environment. If you are flying, how can you then map out the whole environment? But these people, they were able to do this for the hippocampus so that they could see the place cells in these bats. And how do you think they look like? Sphere. Oh, okay. So, and then, uh, and then they also tried to do this with the grid cells, but the grid cells, they need even better coverage in order to see them. And the rumor is that they have seen one grid cell that might have a crystal pattern. But more to come. Well, there must be a problem to put a cable, because uh, <laughs> in the case of a rod, you can put a cable. But in the case of a bat, you need a, I know, a, telemetric, system. a telemetric system. <laughs> and they have. And, they have. Okay. and we, are, we are also are using a telemetric system now okay. for our rats. So the biggest environment we have now with a French uh, postdoc, uh, not PhD student, no, sorry, Valentin Normand, is that uh, he has a four by four meter box. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you need a telemetric system because otherwise you can't uh, let the animal run around. More questions? Right there. Ah. Oh, by the way, he's a journalist. If I may, I, I'm a, a journalist. journalist. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but he's a good journalist. He yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> we, we love journalists. Okay, so. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, there, there is why uh, uh, Norway, with a tenth of the population of Spain, has uh, six Nobel Prize in, in, uh, science, in science, while uh, um, Spain has only two. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, you have uh, I, 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 will, I will return the question to this beautiful university. Do you see all these beautiful people sitting here? Yeah. Smart people. We are waiting for you. <laughs> and you, you, you have you know, some of the best scientists in Spain. Some people here has a very high age index and uh, an advanced grantee, for example, there. So some people with uh, European projects. What? Well, it might not. So, so Absolutely. my question is more related to your space, time, and memory. A Jewish population is uh, only 0.2% uh, of the world, but has uh, almost a fifth of the Nobel Prizes. So uh, is anything related to neurons, or is anything related to politics or to investment? <laughs> <laughs> So, of course, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not educated in politics, so I should be extremely careful. But uh, what I can say helped me was, first of all, my goal was not to get a Nobel Prize. My goal was to understand the world. My goal as a scientist was to understand how the brain is generating our thoughts emotions, behavior, spatial navigation, memory, and all these things. So you saw this child, she's just, I want to understand the world. 
And if you, if you have this passion for a question, that is important, I think. And I know that you all have passion for questions. Then, we came from poor families, so both Edward and me, but we were lucky that we were good colleagues and we were different enough so that the two of us was much more than two, the sum. Uh, we could then work really hard, that is also something really important, and we decided to work on questions that could be broad and interesting for not only ourselves, but also for other people. And that me meant that also the international environment saw what we were studying and they were interested. And we, they knew that we produced solid work and we addressed important questions, not only small questions. And then somehow we were just so naive that we didn't think about how can we fund things, how can we get salaries, even though we had two small children. And I think people around us just saw this, that we were so driven that we couldn't stop it. And they decided to help us. And we were happy if you had been to our first lab, it was a tiny, tiny lab, and we had to train our students from scratch. They didn't know much. And still, we just, let's do it together. We will understand these questions. And then we also, even though the pressure was tough, publish, 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 we had got a wonderful advice from our supervisor, Per Andersen in Oslo, and he said, just relax. And if you relax, you're more creative. And also include a lot of other cultures and uh, different people. But what he said was, if you are able to produce one good quality paper every fifth year, you should be super happy. <laughs> and you know that is against all politics. Because people want to count and say, if you have so and so many papers, then you have success. So we went against this stream because we loved asking these broad questions that we had to work on five, six, seven, eight years before we could publish. I would like to add that two months ago, we had the visit of Finn Kildan, mm -hmm. another Norwegian, a Nobel Prize in Economy. Mm -hmm. and he has some activity here in Galicia, some stable activity in Vigo, oh. which is in the south. More questions? There one. Hello. First of all, I wanted to thank you for coming here to Santiago and sharing your enthusiasm with us. And uh, correct me if, I, if I'm wrong, but I, I, I learned that trace cells would fire whenever the rat would be at the place of an object that is no longer there, right? Yeah. So I wanted to know uh, how long did it take for the rats to grow an attachment towards that object and then they would miss it? Oh, thank you for that question. That's a brilliant question. So I started out by showing the first object that he removed. Then he trained the animal for 14 days. And then the next objects that he had uh, removed, they uh, stayed in the room with the animal only for 10 minutes. But the difference between those two settings, where the animal had been exposed to the position of the object for 14 days and only for 10 minutes, was that it didn't last long, the trace, when uh, the animal was exposed for a short time. So maybe this means that there is something like an accumulation of charge in the cell, because if there is a, a dependence on this time, maybe there is something that, that is accumulating. Any charge in the cell or? 
Yeah, I re potential maybe is, maybe is growing? Thank you for asking that question. So I regret that I didn't spend time on this odor because then, uh, then you really see what happens. But I can try to, to explain it without a figure. So with, with the odors that is quite similar to this trace uh, cell activity, what happens is that if, if, if we talk about this position and uh, the animal has been trained on this object for, uh, over and over again, and you removed the object and then you record, is that there is extensive activity just there. And that means we don't know the mechanism yet, but it could be that uh, interneurons are uh, lowering their firing rate so that uh, the excitation is going up. So we did something similar in, um, in the water mess when the animals were swimming. Uh -huh. And we showed then when we removed the platform, then there was still activity around and they needed some time. And then the inhibitory system was also going down when the activity went up. But it's a very, very interesting question. Well, one more question. Oh, Clara. I am not a student, but I am not a neuroscience, so maybe you could allow my question. But, you know, I am really astonished about this grid pattern. So rodents are very small animals. So would you hypothesize that in humans the grids are bigger, in elephants are huge grids, and in dinosaurs will be like enormous grid or not? Because hippocampus is quite conservative structure in no, I, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you for asking that question. So, um, uh, of course, when I was a child, I really wanted an elephant. <laughs> and I didn't get it. <laughs> so we don't know. Uh, but what we do know is that when we compare the grid cell size in a mouse with a rat, that is 10 times bigger than a, a, a mouse, then the, the grid cell doesn't scale up in the rat as we would expect from the size. So it seems so, so, so the, 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 the grid cells in the mouse are, are, are a bit tinier, but not so much smaller than in the, in the rat that you would expect. So it's, it's an excellent question, but uh, it, uh, yeah. And I have also measured, as you said, they have measured now grid cells in, so we did that in mice and in rats, and then in the bats, and in monkeys, and in animals. No, in, sorry, in humans. <laughs> no, so, so, so we have all, but, but what the, the problems by recording this in humans and in monkeys is that they still haven't had chronic implantations so that uh, the, the humans and the monkey can walk around. So what they have done is that, for example, with the monkey, the monkey is just watching a movie and different movies, and then you can track the eye position, and then you can ask, is the cell active at different places when the animal is uh, moving its eyes. And then uh, Elizabeth Buffalo, for example, in the States, she showed that uh, there are some grid patterns mapping the metric of the eye movements. And with humans, they did it when they had epileptic patients and they had to go into their brains and check where the focus of the epileptic seizure is coming from. And then they could also record and then they could show when the, uh, when the human was sitting there with a laptop in the bed and then doing a virtual reality task, and they saw some uh, grid-like uh, activity. But of course, uh, the activity wasn't as beautiful as you see in the rat because of the testing situation. Well, Raquel is going to kill me, but I want to make a question. Uh, is there any basis for any gender-dependent Difference. You didn't say I would kill you. <laughs> well, 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 just, you know, it is a widespread uh, thought in some cases that yeah, yeah, men yeah, and yeah, women yeah. have different abilities. This is something yeah, that I is agree with you. I do. So, is there any basis? You, you are the person to say no to this. I say no. Okay. So, it's, it's, but, it's, but, but, but I have to say no as a scientist with a bot. 
Um, so if you, if you go at least to, to, if you're talking about rats first, if you go to female rats and male rats, you see grid cells, play cells, head direction cells, border cells, they are equally beautiful in the female as in the male. But then you can ask about spatial navigation and the strategies that we use when we navigate. And those can be different because you can have different preference of what you are paying your attention to. And now I'm talking about myself. I love people, so when I'm walking out, I see people. And if you try ever to navigate, if you concentrate on moving people, you're lost. But if you navigate on some landmarks that are stable, you're not la lost, if you remember them. So, of course, when people want to train themselves to do better in spatial navigation, they have to pay attention to the landmarks that are stable in order to navigate. I'm not the only one in making you this question, I suppose. <laughs> I'm sure you have, no, no, no. you have answered this question. It's an important question. Yes. <laughs> Well, it's time to put the end at this event. Uh, I have to say that I, I want to say, to say thank you to Adam, to Noble Media, and of course to Doris and, and Luis Cordero, because I know they are the responsibles for having this event here. Uh, all the team of AstraZeneca and of Noble Media, some of them are there on the camera. Thank you very much to all, all the volunteers, and of course, Carlos Dieguez, who is here, he is going to host you this afternoon. And uh, well, for me, it was a pleasure, uh, my good master, uh, to be here with you. And now, to, to make the conclusion, I would like to invite first the Vice Dean of the Faculty of Medicine, and then mm -hmm. Doris Casares, the Director General of the AstraZeneca Foundation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Andy. And beautiful <laughs> questions. <laughs>Queridísimos estudiantes de medicina y de otras titulaciones de la USC, estimados asistentes a este acto, in the name of the dean, uh, Professor Julian Alvarez, who is in Madrid attending other professional responsibilities, I give you a warm welcome to the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry, a faculty, as you know, with a long tradition in medical education and, biological, and biomedical research. From today, the 77th of September is part of our history uh, because we have the honor to receive the visit of Professor Maybrit Moser, Nobel Prize in Physiology uh, or Medicine. Thank you very much, Professor Moser, for sharing with us your discoveries about cognitive mapping and the inner GPS system of brain. We really appreciate uh, the very interesting topic of your conference, but also the way you talk about science with passion and creativity. Let me say you that you represent for me, personally for me, the strength of being a woman who reached the top of science without giving up personal and family life. Finally, I would like to express our gratitude to Nobel Media for selecting the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Santiago to hold this conference, and to AstraZeneca Foundation for supporting this event. Thank you very much for your attention. This house is your home, and muchas gracias por la vosa presencia y por la vosa participación en este acto.
Bueno, buenos días, Galicia. Buenos días, Santiago. Uh, good morning, uh, dear Mavery, dear professor. It is my pleasure on behalf of the AstraZeneca Health Foundation today to welcome you all to my hometown, Galicia. I'm very honored to have you here today. And I would like to start the, my speech saying thank you. A big thank you. Thank you to all of you that are here today. I also was a student before, so for me it's amazing to, to be here today and being able to introduce this, this amazing project for us, for the Foundation AstraZeneca. And uh, thank you very much uh, to Victor Arce. Thank you, uh, Vice Rector, uh, for hosting us today. Thank you very much, uh, Vice Decana, Vice Dean, uh, Angela Torres, for hosting us today. And thank you very much, Jorge Mira and Carlos Dieguez, for being so supportive and helpful during all these months. This has been a huge work. And I would like also to thank my, my team, the team of AstraZeneca, uh, Raquel coordinating everything, and all the team behind, all my colleagues from AstraZeneca Health Foundation, and all of you, professors, uh, researchers, scientists, uh, neurologists, everyone who is here today is making this event real and making this event possible. So what I can say is that I have uh, been uh, learning a lot during this inspiring two days with uh, Professor Moser, with Adam Smith from Nobel Media, with all the Nobel Media team. And we have uh, learned about the space, time and memory, but you also made me uh, travel back in time to my young time. And uh, as when we were young, everyone used to collect something. So my main collection was to collect inspiring sentences. And you also remind me of that, because uh, I thought one of my, my favorite sentences was that time is the space between our memories. So today I would like uh, to say thank you for being this great memory for me. I hope this lasts forever with you, with the faculty, with the University of Santiago, with all the students, and let's hope that this memory lasts with us forever with Professor Moser. And for us from the Health Foundation, from AstraZeneca, it's a pleasure to, to, to know and to, and, to, and to be with you today and to see how we are supporting science, we are supporting to improve the life of, of people, of patients, of families, of a lot of uh, persons that are behind the science as well. And uh, if I learned something from you today, is how science can become greater even more with humanity. So thank you very much today again. And uh, thank you for my colleagues. Thank you, Luis, because you have been there. And this is a, a also a, a very good model of, of human uh, colleague in AstraZeneca. Thank you, Raquel. Uh, and thank you, all of you. And have a nice day. Thanks.